Today on the John Akerberg Show, we will examine the topic, Christ among other gods. Maybe you've heard it said that all religions are equal, but do you really think that's true? If you think that all the deities are the same, or that all religions agree on the essential points, then this program is for you. Religion, if it is worth the name, claims to make factual statements about spiritual reality. This means that every religion has the responsibility of giving evidence for its truth claims. Such evidence should be accessible to believers and non-believers alike. Christ presented himself as the one and only qualified Savior who was able to bring men and women to God. Today, we will examine the evidence he gave for his claim and also present the evidence for his extraordinary death and resurrection. My guest today is Dr. Erwin Lutzer, pastor emeritus of the Moody Church in Chicago, Illinois, where he served as the senior pastor for 36 years. He is featured on radio programs across the country, speaks internationally, and is the award-winning author of numerous books. We invite you to join us for this important edition of the John Akerberg Show. Welcome to our program. I'm John Ankerberg. We have a very interesting topic. It's called the death and resurrection of Jesus. Did Jesus actually have an extraordinary death? What happened on that middle cross when he was actually dying? People say, yeah, it was painful, but it was more than that. Then we're going to talk about an extraordinary resurrection. Did Jesus really rise from the dead or was this a story that was just made up? And I have a distinguished guest with me that I love having, Dr. Erwin Lutzer, who is Pastor Emeritus of the Historic Moody Church in Chicago, Illinois. For over 30 years, he was there as the pastor, and he is a philosopher, theologian, has written many best-selling books. And Erwin, I'm glad that you're here today. But I want to get right to the first question. Is there good evidence that Jesus was crucified? One day, Erwin, I was sitting uh, in a convention, and I got up and I stood out on the side, and we had done many programs on this gentleman that all of a sudden was just standing there. So I went up to ask and talk with him, and uh, his name was John Dominic Crossan. He was one of the leaders of the uh, Jesus Seminar, co-founder with Marcus Borg, and uh, actually they were the ones that pulled the beads out of the jar and found out that almost everything that was written that Jesus said in the New Testament, he didn't say, okay? So I went up there and I talked with him, and in, it was very interesting. Even though he denied most of the New Testament, when it came to the crucifixion, was he crucified? Is this a historical fact? This is something that he wrote in his book. He says, that Jesus was crucified is as sure as anything historical can ever be. This event resulted in Jesus' death. In another book he said, I take it absolutely for granted that Jesus was crucified under Pontius Pilate. Now, let me give you one more. I've got 11, but I don't want to spend time on this because we have many, many scholars that come through here that have given this kind of information. But Tacitus, the Roman historian, these are secular, non-Christian people that were writing in ancient history. He lived 55 to 120. Well, Jesus died about 30, so he was right close to the scene. And he was called the greatest historian of ancient Rome. And this is what he said. Christians were named for their founder, Christus, from the Latin, who was put to death by the Roman procurator Pontius Pilate during the reign of Emperor Tiberius. His death ended the superstition for a short time. Interesting what that superstition is, it was the resurrection. But it broke out again, especially in Judea, where the teachings had its origin. Now, I've got all kinds of quotes from secular writers. There are over 11 of them that refer to the death of Jesus, and I think there are even more with some of the new scholarship that's coming out. But I want to get to the point of the fact of what actually, Erwin, happened on that middle cross when Jesus was dying. People have seen movies about it, and uh, they've got their own ideas. But Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus walking, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
Now, there's a great chasm between Christianity and what Christ did on that cross when he was dying than all the other 4,300 religions in the world. And I want you to explain to the folks that are watching, which I'm so glad that you're watching, because this is for you. If you've read John 3.16, John 3.16 actually is the motive for why Jesus suffered and died on that cross. And it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave his son to die on that cross for you that are watching right now. I don't care what country you're in. We're going into over 200 countries right now. Jesus knows about you. He knows about your sins. He knows about your struggles. He knows everything about you and he loves you. And he did something special for you that no other religious leader can do. And Erwin, I want you to explain what he did. First of all, John, I'm so glad to be with you today discussing this because the death of Jesus Christ and what happened there is one of my favorite topics. I never get over it. You already mentioned the fact that it is there that we see the love of God. When you look around the world and you see all the devastation, the natural disasters, COVID, you say, how do I know that God loves the world? Well, the clearest expression of the love of God is found when Jesus was crucified. We know that he was crucified between two thieves and what happened on that middle cross. Many people look at it and they simply think that Jesus suffered because crucifixion was a horrible death. Horrible. They think that he just suffered physically. But something else was happening that was invisible to the human eye. The Bible says that when Jesus died on the cross, as you already uh, implied, God took our sin and laid it on him legally, even though Jesus was sinless, he became legally, legally guilty of adultery, legally guilty of theft and every evil imaginable. Now, what that meant was he was making a sacrifice for sins so that you and I could be forgiven. Now, the question is, where do we see the love of God most clearly? Well, there on the cross, as you already quoted, John 3, 16, Jesus dying. But there we also see the justice of God most clearly because God says, I can't just let bygones be bygones. I need someone to stand in for humanity and I need someone to die for the sins of the world. Now here's the question, who is qualified to do that? I'm not qualified to die for your sins. You're not qualified to die for mine. As we emphasized in this series, it has to be a sinless savior. But here's what happened. When Jesus died and bore our sin, God accepted that so that you and I could be forgiven. Now, there are people listening who are saying, well, Christianity is like other religions. Other religions also have a blood sacrifice. But in Christianity, John, God becomes the sacrifice. That's why Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, that's why he was God in the flesh, so that God is the one who is the Redeemer. He's not just sacrificing somebody out there. In Christ, he sacrificed himself. He did that on our behalf. Now, as a result, and we've already said that Jesus died for sins, and all of us are sinners, we must recognize also that what Jesus did is so unique that it separates Christianity from all the other religions of the world. You've got a great illustration. You're holding it up right now. What is it? All right. Let's suppose that on this side of the ledger, John, we listed every one of the 4,300 4, religions of the world. We could write across the top that they believe that somehow works 
are involved in salvation. They've got to do something. All of them We've have got to different. do something. And, you know, I, uh, I believe in the sacraments and I try to be good and all the other things that we've heard a thousand times. The problem is that if you believe in salvation this way, you can have no assurance. How do you know that you've done enough for God? You don't know how high his standard is. I've talked to people, well, you know, I hope that I'm good enough and I think I'm good enough, but do you know that you're good enough? The answer is no. Yeah, Jesus said, be ye perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. None of us are perfect. And you know what the other thing is? The Bible makes it so clear that we are sinners and sin is abhorrent to God and everything that we do is really tainted with sin. One of the things about the Bible is it gives such an accurate picture of the human heart that sometimes when I read about it, it is astounding. It reveals the heart. Now, on this side of the ledger, you have Christianity because Christianity says there is nothing that you can do to satisfy God. Obviously, it's best if you're a good person rather than a criminal, we'd all admit to that. But actually, both of them are under the condemnation of sin. And I say to everyone who is watching and listening today that it is so critical for them to understand that we constantly miss God's high standard. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, on this side, we discover the good news. And this is the best news that people will ever hear. I love your judge illustration. It might be good to put it in right yeah, here. Yeah, that this is a free gift. A free gift given to those who admit their sins and receive Christ. Now, in order to illustrate what happened there on the cross, there's an illustration that, um, you know, has been told many times. There are many versions of it. This is the version that I heard. A man was speeding and was given a ticket, let's say, for $100, all right? He goes before the judge, but the man has no money. So the judge compassionately and with love walks off the bench, takes off his cloak, puts on ordinary clothes, comes and stands with the defendant and pulls out his own wallet and lays a hundred dollars there on the bench. Then the judge goes back and puts on his robe and uh, says to the defendant, oh, I notice that someone has paid for you and takes the hundred dollars and says, now you go free. God is the one who redeems us. And because of that, we can have the assurance of eternal life. And it is a free gift. It's so hard for people to accept that because our default position is to think that salvation is a matter of works. But I say to everyone who's listening today, absolutely critical. You cannot have assurance as long as you are dependent upon the works or even the sacraments. It is when you understand that Jesus paid it all and when he was suffering there on the cross and when he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was taking our eternal hell that belonged to us and he bore it for us so that he could now freely say to us, you are forgiven, you are received, and you belong to me forever. That's the best news anyone could possibly hear. And this is serious because this is not just talk. Jesus also had a warning on the other side. Whosoever believeth on the Son shall have eternal life, but whoever does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Now, you have another illustration, and we need to get to the resurrection here, but there are a lot of businessmen that are watching. Many of them have sins in their life, some that people know, a lot that people do not know. you got a great illustration of a man that hypothetically went into a room that just had 
files. The room was filled with files, all with folders of the sins that he had committed. It was a private and, file. And here are all these file drawers and all of these cards that list his sins. Now, could you imagine that? Right. And he's going through, and there are some of those cards that make him so filled with shame, so filled of regret. And suddenly, Jesus appears. And he looks over his shoulder and thinks, oh, not him. I don't want Jesus to see this. But then Jesus puts his arm around the man and says, I love you. And then Jesus goes through every file and signs them with his own blood. Jesus is saying that your sins belong to me and I paid for them. That's why we can say today, John, for all who are listening, the issue is not the greatness of your sin. The issue is the wonder of the redemption that Jesus Christ accomplished when he died on the cross. Yes, and when you ask the Lord to forgive you and you admit to him in prayer, I am a sinner, I have done so many sins, please forgive me. He not only forgives you and cleanses you and it's gone as far as he's concerned, but he also gives you the Holy Spirit, okay? The Holy Spirit is there to empower you, to change you, to start to live the way that you should. You don't have the power in yourself. Even after you've said this prayer, you get the power by the Holy Spirit being there so that you, he starts to change you from the inside out, desires that you never had. And I want people to know that this is not just saying a prayer and everything you're gonna do right. No, even Christians that accept Christ, it's a learning process because the Holy Spirit comes to live within you. Now, we have one other thing we wanna talk about and that is the resurrection. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, remember Paul was killing Christians, okay? And the risen Jesus appeared to him two years after the resurrection and he appeared to him on the road to Damascus and Paul received Christ as a savior, okay? He wrote in 1 Corinthians 15 about that experience and what the gospel is. And I want you to listen to these words. I'll read them quick. He wrote to them, this was written in 55, 56 AD, according to the scholars. It was probably preached to them. He says, I preached this to you about 50 AD. There's actually archaeological evidence for this. But now, brothers and sisters, he says, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preached to you. He's saying, you know, I was there. I'm Right now, I'm reminding you of what I said to you before, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By the gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. If you believe, you're in. If you don't believe, you're out. That's what he's saying. Now, what does he say? For what I received, what I received, some people say Paul invented the gospel. No, he said, for what I received, he got it from someplace else. I passed on to you as of first importance. The very key thing that he wants them to know is the gospel. What is the gospel? That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and then to the twelve. Scholars call it a triple hoti. Hoti is and, so and, and, and. This was easy for the people that were illiterate to remember this. So this is a creedal statement, which is a very simple thing that could be passed along to other people. And in the Greek, that's the way it reads. But he goes on. After that, after appearing to Cephas and to the apostles, the twelve, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James. James didn't believe in Jesus his whole life when he lived with him. What changed him? It was the resurrection. Jesus appeared. Can you see Jesus coming into a room? Can you see James? And J Jesus all of a sudden appears in the room and he says, bro, come on over here. Let's talk. <laughs> okay. And he became the leader of the Jerusalem church. He appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles again. And last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. 
Paul is strident in his argument that a man who claimed to be God was put to death and was raised to prove that his claims were valid. Now, what does that mean to you when you hear that? I want to speak to all who have been listening to this. I want to talk from my heart to your heart, particularly those who have watched this and you are a doubter. A doubter maybe even in the resurrection. In the New Testament, there's an interesting story of a man by the name of Thomas. Now, Thomas was one of the disciples. And Jesus appears to the disciples after the resurrection. And uh, Thomas isn't there. We don't know why he wasn't there, but he wasn't. And uh, all the disciples see him later and shout, We have seen the Lord! Ten men agreeing. But Thomas would hear none of it. He said, except I shall see in his hand the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails, I will not believe. Maybe that's where you are. But very graciously, Jesus appeared again to the apostles. And he said, Thomas, come over here. Put your hand into my side where the spear was. Notice the nail prints in my hand. You can touch them. And Thomas said, My Lord and my God. The life and death and resurrection of Jesus was not easily believed by the disciples, but they concluded it because the evidence was powerful and compelling. Come to Jesus with your doubts. There's a song written entitled, Just As I Am Without One Plea, and one of the stanzas says this, Just as I am, though tossed about, with many a conflict, many a doubt, fightings within, and fears without, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Bring your doubts, and Jesus will meet you. Join me in this short prayer, a prayer in which you are transferring your trust to Jesus who died and was raised again. Father, I ask in Jesus' name that many who have listened may see the beauty and the love of the gospel, that you loved the world and Jesus died for sinners. I pray particularly for those who think that they have sinned too greatly Help them to see the wonder of your grace and your acceptance of all who believe. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Folks, I hope that you prayed that prayer. The resurrection was absolutely essential to show that Jesus was deity. No other religious leader rose from the dead. Next week, we're going to continue because he spent 40 days showing himself to people. We have testimonies from all kinds of people that are in the New Testament that we're not sharing with you right now, but they're there. You can read them for yourself. But we're going to continue that at the end of 40 days, he went up to a mountain, met with the disciples for the last time, and then he ascended in the clouds into heaven. And the Bible says he told us he's coming back again. And next week, we're going to talk about why was it necessary? What was the great change in heaven when this crucified Savior came back to where he had left and he took the throne again? But he's coming back again. We're going to talk about that subject. I hope that you'll join us. Stay tuned. John will be right back. Now, thanks for being with me today. If you have thought about what makes Jesus unique among the 4,300 religions in the world today, and you'd like to investigate the information for yourself that you've heard presented, as well as the facts given throughout this series about Jesus, I want you to know that we are making available all six TV programs with Dr. Erwin Lutzer on two DVDs for a gift of $39 each or both DVDs for $78. In program one, he explains why all attempts 
to unite Christ with other religions of the world are doomed to fail. In program two, how our prevailing culture of tolerance has altered even some of our Christian churches' belief about God. Then in program three, why is it logically absurd to believe that all the religions of the world could be equally right? In program four, why does every religion have the responsibility of giving evidence for its truth claims that is accessible to believers and non-believers alike? In program five, we present the evidence for Jesus' extraordinary death and resurrection. In program six, the evidence that Jesus himself gave to show that he was the one and only qualified savior who was able to bring men and women to God. Now, in addition, we're making available Dr. Erwin Lutzer's excellent 252 page book, Christ Among Other Gods. This is for a gift of $15. Now, this is a tremendous book, folks, that is full of crucial information that you'll all want to read. If you wish to have all six programs on two DVDs, plus Dr. Lutzer's important book, they are available together for a gift of only $90. Now, if you live in the U.S., you may order right now by calling us at one 800-805-3030. That's 1-800-805-3030. And you may call that same number any day this week, 24 hours a day. Or you may give your gift at our website right now at jashow.org, where we have a secure place for you to give your gift. That's jashow.org. And then, if you live in Canada, would you please call us at 1-866-746-5803. That's 1-866-746-5803. Or you may order at our Canadian website at jashow.ca. That's jashow.ca. And when we receive your gift, we will send you a receipt and a personal thank you. And I'll appreciate your help very much. This program is sponsored by the John Ankerberg Show Ministries and is made possible by the grace of God and your faithful prayers and gifts.